Welcome to the second webinar presented by the Business Rescue Restructuring and Insolvency Team at Cliff Decker Hofmeyer. My name is Tobi Jordan and I will moderate today's session. Thank you for joining us today. You would have all received an agenda for today's webinar, which serves as a framework for the discussion. You will note from the agenda that we've scheduled a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. You are welcome to post your questions throughout the session and we will attend to them at the end. We will try our best to answer as many questions as we can. Today we'll be discussing director's liability. We'll also look at the current legislative amendments and regulations that have been put in place in South Africa and the impact on general court proceedings. We will conclude our session with a case law update and will specifically focus on the removal of business rescue practitioners and setting aside votes costs to reject a business rescue plan. This webinar is based on the law as it stands on the 30th of April 2020 at 2 o'clock. It does not constitute specific legal advice and it's rather information of a general nature. I ask you to also look out for our weekly newsletter, which contains articles on relevant topics with a focus on navigating our clients through business rescue restructuring and insolvency during COVID-19. The newsletter is published on a Tuesday afternoon. We are privileged to have Safiso Skiniana with us today as a guest speaker. Safiso is the Chief Economist at Thought Leadership Executive at IQ Business. He's currently pursuing his PhD, focusing on development finance and economics. You may have seen his articles in Business Day, Fin24 in the Sunday Times. Today, Safiso will take us through the effect of COVID on the workforce. Now, I wasn't a big fan of economics at Varsity, and I still remember we had this massive textbooks, textbook on micro and macroeconomics. And I'll let you in on a little secret. I actually use my textbook more as a mouse pad than anything else. We had a quick catch up session with Safiso earlier this week, and I can tell you that he's able to make economics fun. So let's then hand over to Mr. Skenyana. Thanks, Toby. Um, I'll also let you in on a little bit of a secret. I used my corporate law textbook also as a mouse pad. Um, I also used it for firewood, uh, but I'm glad I made it to you. Um, and uh, it's certainly, you know, in a time where ESCOM has certainly been problematic for energy generation, I think uh, those corporate law, uh, corporate law textbooks can certainly continue to come in handy for me. Um, I think, I mean, you know, to to contextualize the conversation today, uh, we had the conversation that we keep having uh, very high level discussions around, you know, the COVID impact uh, on the economy, uh, you know, in terms of what's expected growth rate, what's uh, going to happen to our debt to GDP ratios, uh, and that we're expecting, you know, widespread uh, you know, job losses, and as a result, there's the, you know, temporary employment relief schemes and all of these things. But, you know, what we sought to do then is to say, how do we get a lot more detailed in uh, locating the labor? And, and also then how do we assign some risk propensity of that labor force in the current economic climate? And also then what are the opportunities that are available for us from a policy as well as a private sector participation point of view to ensure that we can, you know, uh, promote, uh, I guess, uh, broad uh, um, labor participation in an economy, in a post-COVID economy. And so I think the as a starting point then in the report, uh, you know, what, what we, we aimed to do is to contextualize the, you know, the labor problem in South Africa. The, you know, one of the first issues is around how we've tended to assume or we've tended to believe rather that, you know, we need to fix economic growth. And if we fix economic growth and then we would have fixed the labor problem because jobs should follow. Uh, we have seen, uh, you know, 12 years now of jobless growth in the economy. And that means that um, certainly, you know, you can get economic growth without the subsequent follow from a job accretion point of view. 
um, and you know some of the the numbers you can also observe that are quite interesting is you know the extent to which our manufacturing sector has become increasingly less competitive um, and a smaller contributor to GDP over the last 20 years. Manufacturing in 1996 contributed about 28% to GDP, and now it contributes about 11% to GDP. And our import intensity, and that's how much we import just to sustain domestic demand in the economy, uh, has increased over time, uh, while our export competitiveness has decreased over time. And uh, to actually you know, bring that even closer, so 79% of our exports are attributable to 1% of our exporters. And so that talks to the, the structural design of our economy and, and the industry concentration that we see in our economy. And that in and of itself, I think, can be restrictive for labor accretion because companies then look to do more with less um, from a labor point of view. And so that was one of the labor problems. The many other labor problems, of course, is around labor law. You know, is it restrictive or is it protective? You know, and I think the jury is still out on that one. But um, interestingly enough, some of the global organizations, uh, you know, IMF to be quite specific and the World Bank had, you know, 15 years ago um, joined the call that uh, labor laws in South Africa were restrictive. And by 2015, 2016, they had made a bit of a U-turn and saying actually uh, labor laws as well as minimum wage in this economy are absolutely necessary for the protection of labor as well as uh, reducing the extent of inequality. So I think, uh, you know, in the true nature of, 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 of data information, we continue to observe it, we continue to study it, we continue to analyze trends to see if there's any new information. And so I think uh, making a U-turn is not necessarily a problematic thing, as long as you understand the basis on which you're making that call. And and of course, there you know one of the other issues that we we continue to contend with from a labor point of view is that I've always made the argument that the South African economy makes jobs or creates jobs for the labor force it wishes it had and not for the current labor force it has. And in essence, uh, if you just look at who's been growing in the context of the economy, particularly even in in, in recent days. Um, it's been financial services, and that sector tends to attract semi-skilled and more skilled labor. And yet you look at the composition of a labor force, about 76% of it is either unskilled or semi-skilled. Uh, what makes the picture even more grimmer is the fact that 91% of the people who are unemployed in this country have a metric or less. I'll repeat that part. 91% of the people who are unemployed in this country have a metric or less. And so what it means is that you've got to contextualize your policy plans, you've got to contextualize your growth agenda to the to the composition of your labor force. Um, and so I think then what we, you know, then looked at is that, well, one of the challenges that we've got clearly then is a matching of demand and supply. Uh, from a labor point of view is that the labor that's coming into the marketplace is not the labor that is required in the marketplace. You know, and one of the examples that we use um, for, you know, for, for, for case study analysis point of view is Germany. Um, and one of the things that they did really well is to, is to increase the absorption rate um, in, the, in the people who go through the vocational route. So more than half, about 51% of the German population didn't go the strict academic route, they went the vocational route. And so almost like a, a quasi artisanal route in the South African context. And they've got about a 65% absorption rate of the people who go through that route. And one of the things that are interesting around that is because one, that particular portfolio lives, actually lives in the economic cluster and not in education, um, but it's contextualized in an education point of view. And secondly, uh, the design of the curricula are done in partnership with private sector. And so what that means is that businesses can, uh, you know, influence the direction of or the learning direction to ensure that whatever the business needs of the future um, will be will be solved by the what's coming up or the supply of the labor that's in the economy. So I think we do that just to contextualize the labor problem and why it's not just purely a growth conversation. Um, and of course, and then, uh, you know, the 
the uh, I guess the opportunity is 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 anchored by um, Paul Roma. Uh, he's the the father, I guess, of the endogenous growth theory. And really, what he talks about is that um, long-term economic growth, uh, you know, is endogenously determined, and so it happen it can't happen absent human capital development. Innovation can't happen absent human capital development, and knowledge, uh, the knowledge economy, can't grow absent uh, human capital development. And so, what it says is that whatever investment you make on your capital, on the physical capital, it will not enable you to participate in uh, a particularly long structural shift in economic growth. And I think that's particularly relevant and I mean uh, in the South African context because our failings have been in the investment of the human capital component. And so what we then do, we thought, well, let's locate the labor. Um, let's find out who they are and where they are and 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 how many are where they are and so we, we played around with an idea of what we call the commuter analogy and we said let's break up the labor into labor clusters um into commuter clusters i mean so the first cluster we imagined was the hitchhiker model uh hitchhiker cluster and if you just think about visually imagine a hitchhiker it's, you know it's a person standing on the side of the road thumbs up waiting for a car to go by uh, and whichever one picks them up picks them up you know and and these labor participants are similar to the ones you'll see standing outside of a builder's warehouse you know with a placard saying painter tree feller um, plumber, all of that, and, and and it's truly a hitchhiking model. Anyone who goes past there will pick them up. If they pick them up, if they don't, they don't. And we found that um, this labor cluster, if we if if we locate them based on um, educational attainment, uh, there's about 11% of them in the economy in the labor force. If we locate them by by occupation, there's about 30%, 29% odd. And that's so that's the potential size of, of that labor cluster. So in essence, it means that at a minimum, we've got about 11% of our labor force participants who are hitchhikers. And on the top end, it's probably about 29%. We move on and then said, uh, from there, we've got um, a train rider. And a train rider, in essence, you know, if you imagine, you know, the, the many pictures we've seen of Metro Rail in South Africa and, you know, people hanging off on the side in terms of just how packed they get, you know, and if you imagine just slamming dead brakes on that thing and just how many people will fall off and the kind of inertia that you'll see from a labor point of view. And I think uh, that's the, that you know, from a market participant, those are, for example, the construction workers that we see um, and some of the elementary, um, you know, farm workers, uh, you know, and we've seen about seven, six or seven negative, um, uh, six or seven quarters of negative growth uh, consecutively in the construction sector. I think in the second or third quarter last year, we saw about 152,000 people lost from that particular sector. And this is the inertia that I'm talking about when you hit dead breaks and the impact that it can have from a labor point of view. And so um, again, we locate those people and you know we we cluster them and, and we look at them based on uh, you know education attainment as well as the profession. The next cluster, um, is the bus riders. Uh, the bus riders are, from our perspective, more semi-skilled labor. Um, you know, these are the clerks, the salespeople, some of the call center guys. Um, and, and again, I mean, if you just imagine the, the kind of the bus rider models that you sit under the bus stop, you've got a little bit of shade there. You, you know at some point the bus is going to come, you just don't know when sometimes, right? And then I, I, I think it's very contextual also to, to our, you know, to our labor, our labor context right now. And given the fact that, for example, services has been growing um, as a larger contributor of GDP in our services, financial services and business services making up about 21% of GDP right now, um, you'd find a lot more buses, you know, going towards services than, you know, going towards other spaces. Um, and then, of course, the, on the top end is the Uber riders, and those are the people, you know, who are a lot more skilled, highly skilled, and they've got the, you know, labor mobility, um, more relatively more labor mobility in in, in, a, in a South African context. Those people, even when unemployed, wouldn't be long-term unemployed, we'd probably see them unemployed for less than one year. 
And I think the important thing about doing these clusters is one starting to have a lot more textured conversation around which portions of the labor force are you talking about when you are talking about job losses and because your intervention for bus riders is materially going to be different than your intervention for hitchhikers and for uh, train riders whether it's from a skills capacity building point of view, whether it's around enabling them to start small businesses, whichever choice that you're making for each of those clusters is going to be different. In that, and, and that for us is the opportunity that is coming out of the report of looking at those clusters in that way, because then just to, truly starts to give us an opportunity to be able to target our interventions uh, more specifically and hopefully with a higher rate of efficacy uh, towards the buckets of labor that we're targeting. And and then ultimately what we accelerated towards then is saying uh, how do we cluster the industries as well as the occupations by their risk propensity in the context of the COVID environment? And by that is that there's labor, uh, remote labor index and so from zero to one, uh, you know, uh, from you know zero, you probably can't, you, you really can't work remotely and up to one, you can work remotely and there's a relative difference across uh, occupations, across sectors. And uh, same as the essentialities index that how essential is the business in the context of COVID environment zero to one. And ultimately what we wanted to do uh, by looking at that index is to absolute, to be able to assign a risk to a particular sector and to a particular occupation. And then say then in essence have a view around how many hitchhikers are at risk in a COVID environment, how many um, bus riders, train riders and Uber riders are at risk in a COVID environment, having looked at their ability to work remotely, are they essential or not and are there a health risk? And I think that's certainly for us a, a starting point to truly look at um, you know, the, the COVID impact on labor and the potential impact on labor as well, given those risk matrices. And then ultimately we move towards then and say, then so what? Uh, you know, we've got to imagine an economy in a post-COVID environment. And one of the things that are you know going to continue being important is around um, taking advantage of you know this perfect storm that we find ourselves in. We've been forced now to insource our supply chains from a medical point of view in terms of medical equipment, medical goods, and that means we've got to increase our manufacturing capacity. Uh, you know, and as I said, manufacturing has declined as a contributor to GDP, and so now is an opportunity for us to build capacity going forward in that particular space. Um, and and that's a you know it's perfect uh, example for example around us taking advantage of that. Uh, we're going to see a lot more development and funding towards health tech, um, ed tech, um, agri tech, and so again these are going to be you know highly innovative businesses, but they're going to be quite interesting in terms of the kind of labor force that they can attract as well as uh, retain. And and so these are some of the thinkings, and uh, in the report you'll find all of the other ideas that we've got around. Uh, reimagining um, an economy post COVID uh, by focusing on building resilience as well as building capacity as the primary strategy for um, enhancing labor absorption as well as protecting labor in a current and a distressed economic uh, climate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sophie. So I really found that to be very interesting and I will always remember your analogy whenever I catch your Uber, and I hope that will be soon. Um, I will now hand over to Richard Marcus. Um, Richard is based in our Cape Town office, and he will take us through director's liability when trading in financially distressed or insolvent circumstances. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thanks, Toby. I'm just going to get up my notes. Um, so the topic I've been asked to talk about is uh, the role of directors and their responsibilities in those circumstances where a company might be facing some sort of financial difficulties. And that's obviously very important now because we've all been caught short by this COVID event. And there'll be many people in the management of companies who are looking down the telescope and saying what is coming and how is my business going to do and what should I be doing and how do I protect myself if things aren't looking good. So. Going through the topic, I just want to deal briefly to contextualize things, the general duties of directors. And that's quite important because whatever you do, you'll be measured against those general duties. 
uh, when your conduct may be assessed in the future. So looking at that, let's just have work through the firstly those particular issues and then look more specifically at the problem of insolvency and what it does to directors. Who are the directors? The directors aren't only the directors. They include all the appointed elected alternate directors. Executive directors and non-executive directors are treated exactly the same way. But the law has expanded the category somewhat and said it's not just the people who are on the board of the company, it includes the concept of what they call a prescribed officer. And I'll just summarize a definition of what a prescribed officer is over and above a director. It's a person who exercises a general executive control over and management of the whole or significant part of the business of, or activities of the company. So that, for example, could include a general manager, a manager of a very important division that's operating in the, within the company. It also includes people like the company secretaries and also people who serve, and there might be outside parties, on things like audit committees or any other committees of the company. So when I talk about directors in this concept, I'm talking about that expanded definition. And those people, prescribed officers, who are non-directors are presumed to have the duties of directors when they exercise those functions. And we found our, our duties of directors both under the common law, which hasn't changed, has evolved for, for a long time, and a level of codification that's not taken place in the Companies Act. And it's important to consider that. And what's also important to consider is your duties as a director in that regard are owed to the company. They're not owed to creditors or people outside of the company. But when those people are looking at your conduct as a director or a prescribed officer, they can consider and will look at the way you conducted yourself as a director and whether, whether you me measured, uh, me measured up to the standards of care that are required. So the fundamental rule is this, you must always act in the best interests of the company. And everything else is really an expansion or an elaboration or explanation of that fundamental rule. So looking at what those duties are, you must always act for the benefit of the company with a proper purpose. You can't act beyond the authority that you're given in the company, beyond the powers that the company gives you under its MOI. You must always make sure you confine yourself to what your authority levels are. A very important consideration, and this arises because it's quite a tense issue, is your duty is only to the company that you serve. You're not ever allowed to be a puppet on a string for the shareholder who appoints you. And obviously that's often a problem because shareholders who appoint directors to boards usually do that for that reason. They want to have some influence or they want to have some control over what the company might do. And that director can be put in a very difficult position because they pressed between the shareholders uh, instruction and the obligation to do what's best. So when you are a director, always remember fundamentally, you've got to act in the best interests of the company. And the rule not to uh, uh, act contrary to its interest expands outwards. And some obvious things apply. You have to disclose personal interests. You have to recuse yourself when you uh, have an interest in a contract. And you can't act in competition with the company under the common law. You can't make a secret profit. And what's important to note is the new Companies Act has actually taken things further and it's tried to, again, codify what it expects directors and principal officers to do. Again, fundamental rule, exercise care, skill and diligence. And that's not just a random thought, there are actually two tests which are applied to you. The first test is you must act as a director would be expected to act in a company. So objectively, are you complying with your general duties as a director? But there's also a further subjective element to that. So, for example, the financial director who is a chartered accountant will be expected to conduct himself or herself with the skill that a chartered accountant in that position would do. So an expanded uh, range of obligations in that regard. Most importantly as well, directors must apply themselves to the company, and this is particularly acute where you're appointed as a non-executive director. 
You can't sit there and relax. You've actually got to go and find out about the company and know what's going on. And that's particularly important in a financial context. A little bit of relief for directors is even though they might have been found wanting under some obligation or another, they can escape liability if they exercise what is called business judgment. And business judgment really boils down to this. You must take the necessary steps to become informed about what's going on. You must be diligent. You must read your board packs. You must get the information you need. And if you're going to make decisions either individually or collectively, you must have a rational basis, a rational basis for believing that decision is in the interests of the company. So that's very important. And particularly now looking down your telescope, if you are concerned about things in the future, if you have to make difficult decisions, go and get advice, not only from the people who have knowledge inside the company, but if you have to go to your external advisors to consider things like whether you're solvent or what your position is going to be, and you talk to accountants and lawyers outside your company and you take their advice, unless it's stark raving mad, you will be allowed to rely on that advice. And even if it turns out with the wisdom of hindsight not to be the correct advice. Bottom line is, as long as you apply business judgment, act diligently, you can get away with mistakes, genuine mistakes. So that now contextualizes directors due to this generally. How does that come into the concept of uh, insolvency and companies coming into financial difficulties? Interesting enough, the old act and the new act both have application here. Under the new act, there's a section which says, and I'll read it, a company must not carry on business recklessly with gross negligence or with intent to defraud any per person or with, for any fraudulent purpose. And what's important to note there, it's not you as the director which uh, must not carry on the business recklessly. In other words, if it's an insolvent circumstances, you proceed regardless. It's the company that must do that. But, but the cases have found that obviously because the company acts to its directors, if the company does that, then of course the directors have done that because they've conducted the company on that basis. So you could find yourself liable for a company because you're running the company that does these things. This particular section of the New Companies Act doesn't give outside parties the right to intervene directly. It allows the company's SIPSI control mechanism to kick into force and they can actually suspend companies from operations. In reality, that's often or unlikely to happen in many cases, but what is important is the liability that stems from you conducting yourself in this way. And there's a very wide catch-all provision in the Companies Act under Section 218, and I'll read it to you. It says personal liability will accrue in the following circumstances. Any person, any person, so a director or a principal officer uh, can be liable for misconduct under that basis. Section 424 still applies. It says outside parties, shareholders, creditors of the company and liquidators can go after you in your personal capacity if you trade recklessly or fraudulently. Recklessness means you have no, you trade with wanton disregard for the consequences of risk taking. You don't comply with your duties. You don't comply with the business judgment rule. You just proceed on regardless. And there you are looking for trouble. There are two tests now to assist people and to make sure they do their jobs properly. One is the solvency and liquidity test under section four, which says at any time you are obliged to assess and look forward on a 12 month basis and say, is my balance sheet positive and will I be able to pay my debts in the ordinary course of business in 12 months? So both balance sheet solvency and commercial solvency are important. You can be good on one and miss the other. Secondly, there's what we call the financial distress test. If you're unable to pay your debts in a reasonable perception within following six months, you are actually deemed to be financially distressed and then the board actually has to take a decision to put the company into business rescue. So you as the board sitting there have to look at these things constantly on a rolling basis to decide if you're falling into any of these categories. Be vigilant, that's the critical thing, be vigilant. I had a client who called me in the tourism business with a lot of cash from good trading, but he said, I don't know what my business is going to be like going forward. I said, you've got to apply these principles all the time. Some guidance through the cases, where are you reckless? You're not reckless if you take 
uh, a material but non, not high risk of, of not being able to pay somebody. You are certainly reckless if you know you can't pay somebody and you take the risk and you run the, do the transaction. It's kind of been refined to this in the law that if there's a very strong chance without being certain that you're not going to be able to pay your creditors, a very strong chance that you can't pay them, then you're on the scope of acting recklessly and open to liability. And bear in mind too that it's not the carrying on of business, it is nothing more than an implied representation that you will you will be able to pay. You're not warranting to people you trade with, nor as a director are you have do you have to be risk averse. You obviously in business you must taste risk. That's what business is all about. It's about your diligence, the reasonableness of your conduct, and whether you scope forward all the time. Just to give you an example, two simple examples. You may remember some of you some years ago, CNA went bankrupt, very unexpected, a bit of an EDCON situation of its time. What happened there, the directors were, knew the business was in trouble, they had a, a plan in place, but the bank pulled the overdraft unexpectedly. The court said, yes, they were in trouble, but they were reasonably aware of they could trade out of it through the plan, and unfortunately, the bank unexpectedly put them in difficulties. That wasn't reckless. Another case found, however, if, if you know you're in trouble and you take money for yourself, above your criticism, very obviously you're acting recklessly in those circumstances. So those are kind of examples of what, what can happen. And there's a further consequence, please bear in mind, that if courts have found that if you found to have acted recklessly or fraudably, ipso facto, as a result of that, you will also ought to be declared a delinquent director. So there's a further adverse consequence to directors who do these things. You've got to look after your businesses, scope forward and make sure that you're doing it properly. That's the message coming through. In the old days, the courts were much more reluctant to interfere in how businesses were run. We're seeing a trend for the last 10 years that people are being called upon to take accountability for what they do and how they conduct themselves, and they are being found liable for, for conduct which doesn't meet the required standards uh, under law. So all I can advise you is Please be careful out there. We are a lot of businesses are in difficulties. Be acutely aware of what your future looks like. Take good advice. Try to make the best decision you can with the knowledge you have, and you should be okay. Thank you very much. Toby, you are on mute. I'm so sorry about that. Keep on forgetting to unmute myself. Thank you, Richard. Um, that was a really interesting. That is a really interesting topic for me, and also very important to clients to take note of. I would like to encourage our listeners to participate in the online Q and A. Maybe I see that there haven't been any questions coming through, so perhaps I can just take you through how to participate. When you hover your mouse over the screen, you will see that there's a horizontal tab that will come up. And right to the far right next to the red button, there would be a tab that you'll see that when you hover over to the Q&A sign pops up. So click on that, it will take you to the right where you can where you can post questions and we'll deal with those questions at the end. I would now like to hand over to my colleagues, Kylene Bayers and Jessica Osman. Kylene is a senior associate and Jessica, a Canada attorney, both at our Santa offices. And they will discuss the current legislative amendments that we've seen in foreign jurisdictions. Thank you, Kylene and Jess. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really good to be back for our second webinar. And I'll be joined in my discussion by my colleague Jessica Osmond. And we will be discussing the legislative amendments made in other jurisdictions across the globe in an effort to combat the economic impact of COVID-19 as compared to those taken by South Africa. So the jurisdictions that we will be covering on this webinar are the USA, the UK, Australia, Singapore and Spain. We'll thereafter then consider the position in South Africa as it stands today. From the outset, it's important to provide some context to these legislative amendments implemented in the various jurisdictions. On the 5th of April 2020, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II delivered a statement to the world, wherein she made a profound observation. 
She highlighted that the fight against COVID-19 is like no other global crisis she has ever experienced or faced before. What makes COVID-19 so unique is that all nations have come together in a common endeavor. The world is united, combining advances in science and our instinctive compassion to heal and to overcome the virus and its devastating impacts. It is therefore unsurprising that various nations have been looking to one another for guidance. In an effort to curb the effect of COVID-19 on businesses and economies, governments across the globe have undertaken to adopt and amend various pieces of legislation. So we'll be discussing some of those policy changes right now. But before I kick start with the other jurisdictions, I do want to highlight that South Africa has not yet followed suit from these other jurisdictions and there's been no real policy reform from an insolvency and business rescue perspective. So the question is, to what extent can we expect similar policy changes going forward here on home ground? First, we're going to consider the position in the USA. With the USA being the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been some noteworthy policy changes adopted in different states and jurisdictions in an effort to alleviate the effects of COVID-19 and on the US economy. The CARES Act, which stands for Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security, has been adopted in the USA in order to support both businesses and individuals through government funding schemes. The CARES Act has provided for relief in many areas, including, amongst others, payment uh, paycheck protection, which allows for eligible businesses to maintain their payroll and certain overhead expenses through the period of emergency, and also allowing the deferral of employer taxes for 2020, with 50% of payroll tax payments for 2020 being due in 2021, and the remaining 50% being due in 2022. Other policy changes include the Federal Reserve, which stands for Fed, has reduced interest rates to essentially zero. The rate of emergency lending at the discount window for banks has been reduced by 125 basis points to 0.25%, and the term of loans has been lengthened to 90 days. The Federal Reserve also cut the reserve requirements for many banks to zero. And lastly, there have been many um, mortgage loan corporations that have implemented a 60 day suspension of foreclosures or evictions and plans to reduce or suspend mortgage payments for up to 12 months for those affected by COVID-19. Moving on to the UK, the UK has adopted a series of temporary measures to combat the disruption caused by COVID-19. And some of these include the following. The Monetary Policy Committee voted to cut bank rates to 0.1%, subject to eligibility, and allowance for a three-month VAT payment deferment has been adopted. Business rates holidays for retail, hospitality, and leisure businesses have been extended for the 2020 and 2021 tax year. The Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme has been temporarily introduced in order to provide loans, um, overdraft facilities and other financing options to SMEs. The Bank of England will, under the new COVID-19 financing facility, buy short-term debt from larger companies, allowing companies to finance their short-term liabilities. Under the new coronavirus bill, commercial tenants who are unable to pay their rent due to COVID-19 will be temporarily protected from eviction. The Prudential Regulatory Authority set out supervisory expectations that banks should not increase dividends or other distributions in, in response to policy actions. And then lastly, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy announced a number of amendments to the UK insolvency law. This includes the temporary suspension of the of wrongful trading provisions to give company directors greater confidence to use their best endeavors right now to continue to trade during this pandemic emergency without the threat of potential personal liability should the company ultimately fall into insolvency, as well as the prohibition on the exercise of express insolvency termination clauses in contracts. With regards to the steps taken in Australia, on the 22nd of March 2020, 
Australian Treasurer Joshua uh, Frydenberg announced amendments to the Corporations Act of 2001 to provide temporary relief for financially distressed businesses caused by COVID-19. As a result, the Coronavirus Economic Response Package Omnibus Act, also referred to as the SERPA Act, was passed by Parliament on the 23rd of March on, of this year. The amendments introduced by the SERPA Act will apply for a, a six month period, but it may be extended um, or have effects past this timeline. The SERPA Act introduces some of the following amendments. An insolvent trading safe harbour, constituting a six month moratorium on insolvent trading liability for directors in respect of debts incurred in the, in the ordinary course of the company's business. Directors will not become personally liable for any such debts as would normally be the case under the pre-COVID-19 insolvent trading regime in the event that the company is ultimately wound up. For both personal and corporate insolvency matters, the government is providing a temporary increase to the debt amount required to issue a statutory demand against a company and a bankruptcy notice against an individual. The current minimum threshold for creditors to issue a statutory demand on a company has been increased from $2,000 to $20,000 for the next six months. Companies will also have six months to respond to a statutory demand. This is an increase from the previous 21 day time, um, time frame, which is a precursor to winding up proceedings being commenced by creditors, which is actually similar to ours in South Africa. The Treasurer has been given instrument making power to amend provisions of the Corporations Act of 2001 to provide relief from or modify obligations under that act. And lastly, the National Cab Cabinet agreed to a six month moratorium on evictions for residential and commercial tenants that have been affected by the coronavirus. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague Jessica Osmond, who will further discuss the various legislative amendments in Singapore and Spain, and will also look at some of the policy amendments here in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Carleen. Um, good afternoon, everyone. As Carleen mentioned, my name is Jessica Osmond and I'm a candidate attorney in our business rescue restructuring and insolvency team at CDH. Following on what from um, from what Carleen has touched on, I will continue with further jurisdictions that have had some noteworthy amendments over this period in legislation and different regulations in an attempt to curb the economic effects that have been felt worldwide as a result of the pandemic in which we we've all faced. So turning to that of the response that Singapore has adopted, we saw that on the 7th of April 2020, the Singapore government introduced the COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act. These temporary measures will remain or are planned to remain in place for a period of six months um, at which at which stage they will we will decide whether or not to extend it to a period of 12 months. We've seen this COVID-19 Act has caused for the following amendments, particularly pertaining to bankruptcy and insolvency proceedings and the effect thereon. And so similarly to what Carleen mentioned, we've seen that similarly to that of Australia, Singapore have also allowed for the monetary threshold for company bankruptcy filings to be increased from an amount of $10,000 to that of $100,000. Um, furthermore, also similar to Australia, the time to respond to statutory creditor demands has been extended from 21 days to now six months, once again, giving giving some debtors just a, a chance to breathe during this time. Interesting, interestingly, though, in contrast to what Richard spoke to, and I know Carleen mentioned it with regards to Australia, directors of Singapore companies have been temporarily been relieved from their obligations to prevent their companies from trading while insolvent if the debts that caused for the insolvency have been incurred in the company's ordinary course of business. However, it is important to note that these directors still remain criminally liable should these debts have arisen by way of fraudulent or criminal conduct. 
also with regards to the banks in Singapore, there hasn't been they haven't been majorly affected by the COVID by the temporary measures COVID Act. However, there has been an exemption in so far as the the bank's right to commence with legal action for defaults on a loan covered under the over the under the COVID-19 Act. Finally, we turn to look at the legislative amendments made in Spain. As we all know, Spain has been one of the hardest hit European countries um, by the pandemic, second to that of Italy. And so it's no surprise that there has there's been a, a need for for various avenues to be sought in terms of legislative amendments in order to to mitigate the effects that the pandemic has had on the on the economy. And so we saw that on the 14th of March 2020, um, the, the Spanish government declared a state of emergency and introduced several royal decree laws in order to mitigate the impact COVID of COVID-19. These uh, royal decree laws have caused for the following amendments to be made and specifically focusing once again on bankruptcy and insolvency proceedings. We've seen that there's been a three month moratorium introduced on mortgage payments for habitual residents for borrowers experiencing difficulties in making such payments as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. This moratorium has been extended to individuals who are professionals or entrepreneurs as it as it pertains to professionals um, for their professional or business premises. We've also seen a three month moratorium on repayments for consumer credit and so not limited to to mortgage loans, but also extended to non mortgage loans for individuals experiencing difficulties in making these payments as a result of COVID-19. It's also interesting to note that they that they've also they've um, stopped any interest or late payment interest accruing over this three month period. Um, we've also seen that creditors petitions for compulsory liquidation, similar to our affected persons filing for the liquidation of a company in South Africa, that has now been um, st uh, stayed for a period up until two months after the state of emergency has ended. And even during this, after this period, the debtors own filings, so similar to our um, voluntary liquidation filings, will be given priority, even if these debtors filings are submitted thereafter. And so, as Colleen said, much like the nations above South Africa, although not really on the in on the same page with regards to bankruptcy and insolvency, we have seen South Africa embarking on quite a few policy amendments in order to combat the spread of the virus. Um, as Safiso mentioned, the the economic the economic impact that the lockdown has had on South Africa and on the economy. It's, it is noteworthy to note that there have been legislative measures taken by the South African government thus far, and I'd like to just touch on a few, one of which being the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, known as the DTRC, published regulations in terms of Section 1010 of the Competition Act, whereby the retail property sector has now been exempt from Chapter 2, specifically Sections 4 and 5 of the Competition Act, of which such, such sections ordinarily prohibit entities in horizontal and vertical relationships from entering into agreements or engaging in practices which prevent or lessen competition in the market. And so we've seen their retail property sector has been exempt from that. Further, the DTRC has also introduced the Consumer and Customer Protection and National Disaster Management Regulations and Directions, of which the aim is to protect um, consumers from unfair, unreasonable, improper or unjust commercial practices in response to a surge in demand during the national disaster. As we would have seen from the news the, of late, the Competition Commission is not taking these complaints lightly and should a retailer or any business be seen to be in breach of this of this direction or directive, um, they will it, it will be met with severe fines. Under the regulations, we've seen that retail tenants and retail property landlords may now conclude agreements allowing for rental payment holidays, rental discounts and limitations on the evictions of tenants. This similar block, these similar block exemptions have also been issued to the healthcare and banking sectors as well as the hotel industry. 
Then lastly, we've also seen that the CRPC has undertaken to now not invoke its powers under Section 22 of the Companies Act and will therefore not be issuing notices to companies during this time where the company has continued to trade even while temporarily insolvent due to COVID-19. And so going forward, as Colleen previously mentioned, it will be interesting to see if these various, if, if the various jurisdiction and, the, and their amendments, if that will have a ripple effect on the insolvency related legislative amendments taking place in, in South Africa. And we, we will just wait to see if South Africa will follow suit. So thank you. Thank you, Jess and Colleen. I must say I was expecting a little bit more movement on amendments in South Africa, um, but maybe we'll see that coming up soon. Um, I would now like to hand over to my colleagues Lucinda Rudy and Pauline Menaka. Um, they're from our offices in Cape Town and Kailin, uh, sorry, and Lucinda and Pauline will take us through the regulations that have been put in place. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am Lucinda and I'm a director in the Cape Town Dispute Resolution Department. It seems to be a delay on Lucinda's side. Um, what I can ask maybe if we can't get Lucinda back, is that that we can possibly move over to Pauline. Pauline, if you're available to step in. It appears that there's some technical difficulty with Lucinda in Cape Town. Pauline, are you there to maybe step in? Good afternoon. Hi, Toby. Um, sure, I think I'll, I'll, I'll start with my section, although it's supposed to flow from Lucinda's section. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to be discussing um, very briefly, it's quite a, it's an overview of how business rescue and liquidation proceedings have been impacted by the government measures implemented due to COVID-19. Uh, for those of you who were with us last week, you may recall that the what, the why and the when, so the three W's of business rescue and liquidation was covered in some detail by the speakers. I'll be providing an overview of the practical and the procedural issues related to the functioning of our courts, the master's offices and SIPSI as these institutions play a key role in business risk in the condition proceedings. Um, as you know by now, a lot, quite a lot has happened since the previous webinar. Uh, the government has announced a gradual reopening of the economy and they're starting to ease the level five hard lockdown to restrict it to the level four, which is taking starting tomorrow. Another perhaps not surprising development is that SA Express has been placed under provisional liquidation following urgent application was brought in the Johannesburg High Court by its business risk petitioner. I think um, related to what I'll be talking about, some initial takeaways from that application that are quite interesting are that firstly, SA Express at the time of the application was not providing an essential service. The application was brought on an urgent basis. The entire application was heard before the judge, judge using video conference. In spite of the proceedings mo mostly running electronically, by that I mean there was service of notices and pleas and documents electronically were allowed, the judge did raise the issue during the hearing, uh, a concern regarding proper service of documents, as we know that during the level five lockdown, there, there were no sheriff services available. Um, we anticipate that um, the issue of services might continue into level four lockdown. Um, in addition to SA Express News, we also learned that EDCON announced that it will also be filing for voluntary business rescue, um, to aiming to do that before the 1st of May to allow it to continue to operate along the param as long as the parameters of the Level 4 lockdown guidelines stay in place. Business rescue will, of course, allow EDCON to continue trading while its affairs are then restructured again uh, to avoid a liquidation, since a moratorium will be placed on payments to creators, giving the company time to breathe. So 
what is the status of legal proceedings at a level level five? I think it's important to discuss both level five and how we move into level four, because we know that we might be moving between the various levels and may not remain on a certain level for a long time. So at level five, the Chief Justice issued directive, Chief Justice of the, of the, of the court system, that had a ripple effect across our high courts and our lower courts. He limited the, in effect, what happened is that there is limited access to the courts and no new matters could be initiated unless they related to COVID-19 regulations and other issues. Um, parties were also encouraged where matters were involved and urgent had to be heard. Parties were encouraged to forego oral argument and to agree to video conferencing subject to the judge's directions. There were no sheriff services, so no service of applications and summonses, and of course, no issuing execution of warrants of execution. Master offices were also closed and SIPSI services, which include the registration of voluntary liquidations and business rescues, were also limited. From tomorrow onwards, we obviously were entering level four. New regulations have been announced and gazetted, which include essential legal administrative services. However, these regulations on a first glance seem quite vague and are probably open to a wide interpretation. Therefore, they are subject to further clarity from the heads of the various institutions. The services named include heads of courts, services from the judiciary, services related to the functioning of the courts, master's offices are supposed to open, there will be essential services um, from SARS. At level four, we also know that all newspaper services along with postal services for le level four professions will continue, which so will be allowed, not continue, which probably um, hints at the fact that we'll be able to uh, publish notices in the Government Gazette that's related, of course, to liquidations. And another interesting regulation that was announced is that courts are allowed to grant eviction um, orders. However, the enforcement of the eviction order is subject to um, the stage of the level. So it will be stayed and suspended until the end of level four. So, so we know that a lot of what's happening at level four mirrors some of what ha what's happened at level five in terms of the restrictions, but it does appear that access to legal services and proceedings will be expanded. Now, jumping quickly into liquidation proceedings specifically, we know that there are two ways in which a company can be liquidated. It's either by voluntary winding up or by court orders. A, a company can be liquidated voluntarily if the company passes a special resolution resolving that it be so liquidated. During level five, SIPSI issued a notice of DS non, which basically, but it was related specifically to business rescue. Nothing was said specifically relating to liquidation proceedings. We'd have to assume that they would take the same similar position regarding voluntary liquidations they did to the filing of business rescue proceedings. We anticipate, however, that moving forward, SIPSI is going to revise its position and we await a new statement at level four. We also know that at level five lockdown, the master's office and government printing services were closed. This means strictly speaking, that a company could take a special resolution, file it with SIPSI, but then SIPSI may not register the special resolution and then may not transmit a copy of that to the master. Even if SIPSI were to manage to transmit that uh, resolution to the master. The master, because they close at level five, may not straight away attend to the appointment of a provisional liquidator and or notify or notices in the government gazette, the point of which of course is to notify affected parties so that a, a meeting of creditors can be held and the appointment of a liquidator can take place. So moving into level four, knowing that the master's offices will be open, what we don't know unfortunately at this stage is the extent of services that will be rendered. So we don't know how quickly and efficient the master's the master's offices will render services and how they will render. Are they going to are they going to go back and rely on hand delivery or are they going to open up to more electronic services of documents? So a filing of documents on their on them and of course um, having have to have regard to the potential backlog that will be faced by the master's offices across the country. Moving quickly now into court liquidations, um, a company obviously can also be liquidated by way of court order. With the exception of the Gauteng High Courts, which include both Pretoria and Johannesburg, which enable applications electronically using a platform called Case Lines, similar services are not available in most of the courts across the country. Therefore, we know at a level five stage, it's very difficult 
for a normal ordinary liquidation application to be issued and those proceedings to get going. Another concern which was highlighted regarding um, court applications by the, in the, by the judge in the SA Express case is that of service of applications and or provisional winding up orders being served on affected parties. It's likely that it will be for the applicant to show that the court that it has successfully served um, the various documents and applications on affected parties. I think briefly on business rescue, um, although business rescue proceedings can be instituted either by board resolution or court order, business rescue by board resolution should um, be the preferred solution in light of the delays and issues related to the court proceedings. Our colleagues, Toby, my colleagues, our colleagues, Toby Jadar and Stephen Fenter, have published a detailed article outlining the steps of business rescue in the current environment. For those of you who have not seen that article, please let us know. We can have a copy sent to you. On a very high level, there are at least three potential problems I see with business rescue, um, again, relating back now to the, the level five lockdown, and that is the registration of special resolutions. That takes us back to this comment about SIPSI and the non-DS, the notifications on affected parties, the appointment of business rescue petitioners, and potentially the holding of meetings. Obviously, in regard to holding of meetings, we must keep in mind that there are services Oh, sorry, not services, platforms such as Zoom and Microsoft and Skype that are available for the holding of such meetings. Another issue is the timeless objections and oppositions to business rescue itself and to the appointment of a certain business rich petitioner. Um, under level four, it seems that these restrictions may be um, relaxed, but we're going to have to these restrictions or difficulties that we anticipate under level five may become easier under level four. But again, it's a bit of a waiting game to see what the various institutions direct. Uh, I think SA Express and EdCon are important and useful examples now to navigate liquidations and business rescues proceedings moving forward. Um, I think that, however, all our, all our, everyone that's listening that's potentially going to be affected by liquidation and business rescue should continually seek legal advice um, because we might be moving, as I said before, between the different levels at any time. Um, thank you. I'm going to take it back to Lucinda. Hi, everybody. Sorry about that. I think my Wi-Fi also went on lockdown for a while. Um, so thank you, Pauline. Um, Pauline has now taken you through the practical difficulties we think will be encountered with business rescue and liquidation applications going forward. Um, I would like to just briefly this afternoon touch on certain of the government's financial relief initiatives that's currently available to South African businesses during the lockdown and which I believe would in all likelihood be extended for a significant period after the lockdown. This week, the media reported that government is expecting the peak of COVID-19 only in September this year and that the, <clears throat> the risk adjusted approach that government is taking now in regard to the lockdown levels may be with us and may continue for at least the next six to eight months. So we're in it for the long haul, unfortunately, and the impact of the, the pandemic, the lockdown, as well as the regulations that's restricting not only the movement of people, but also businesses to only being operate in, to be a being able to operate in the essential goods and services industries, especially on SMMEs is very well documented and, and there's a real risk that a majority of SMMEs will just not be able to reopen their doors after the lockdown is lifted. We know that some businesses will from tomorrow be able to commence trading or to expand um, their operations, but some industries will just still not be able to operate at all. I think we can all agree that the industries that's most affected by the lockdown is your hospitality industry, especially your restaurants, your bars, your hotels, the tourism and travel industry, and then of course the liquor and the tobacco industry is severely affected. It's however not only the SMMEs that is under severe financial pressure. Pauline mentioned it gone. We know about SA Express and nobody knows what is going to happen to SAA, but it's not looking good. 
as this webinar started, it was reported in the media that um, Associated Media Publishing, who is the publisher of Cosmopolitan, House and Leisure, is actually closing its doors permanently from tomorrow. And the CAO was quoted that this is because of the devastating impact of COVID-19. Retail landlords are also feeling the brunt because retail tenants are all seeking rental remissions. Commercial banks must be feeling the pain because on the one hand, they've got clients that's just not servicing their debts. And on the other hand, they've got government that is putting a lot of pressure on them to assist ailing businesses and their clients. So to assist with and alleviate the financial impact of COVID-19, there is a lot of relief initiatives out there. It's imperative, and Kylene mentioned this last week during the webinar as well, that businesses go out there, find out what relief measures are available to them, do they qualify, and if they do, to apply for such relief. So I'm going to mention just a few. The idea is not to go into detail as to what the requirements are, but hopefully I can mention one of two that you were not aware of and that you can then look into. So the Department of Small Business Development has two initiatives. There's the debt relief finance scheme of 200 million, which targeted all businesses negatively affected by COVID-19. Then there's the business growth initiative of 300 million, which is targeted at businesses who are able to take advantage of the COVID-19 supply opportunities by meeting the shortages that may exist. We have the South African Future Trust, that's the one billion rand from the Oppenheimer family that's targeted at SMMEs with a turnover above 25 million. We have the old Mutual Masizani Fund, which is a fund of 40 million that is specifically targeted at SMMEs that need assistance in staying solvent during this period. There hasn't been much detail released about that fund. We have the Sukuma Relief Program and Mary Oppenheimer Fund, which is available to SMEs. The Department of Tourism has made available relief funding of 200 million rand for tourism and hospital industries. Um, they must be in existence for more than one year and they must have a turnover of more than 2.5 million. And what is interesting is this includes accommodation, restaurants, catering, travel and related services. The funding is capped at 50,000 Rand per entity. We all know about TERS, the Temporary Employer Employee Relief Scheme, which is provided to all businesses registered with the UIF and it is applicable to help with the replacement of lost income to employees. We've got Solidarity Fund, which focuses on providing relief for existing debts and the repayment thereof. And then, as Jessica mentioned, the property industry in collaboration with SAPOA, the South African Rate Association, and the SA Council for Shopping Centres came together and announced a retail tenant assistant package, which inter alia deals with the restriction of, of, of evictions and also rental discounts for April and May. That fund was established and dealt only with the months of April and May, but I'm sure that those entities and institutions will come together and try and extend that also through June and July. Then on the 21st of April, the president also announced certain or further relief measures, including the deference of taxes and potential tax cuts for businesses. So. As Pauline said, despite all of these relief initiatives, it is very, very clear that foreclosures, liquidations and business rescues are going to increase dramatically during the extended lockdown and thereafter. Um, we just don't know how the courts are going to deal with this. Um, one phrase that's often used now is people talking about this is our new normal and how are we going to deal with it? And I think we're getting a glimpse of what is going to be legal processes going forward. As Pauline mentioned, Matt is being heard via video conferencing, Zoom platforms, but how that is going to practically impact 
on liquidations and um, business risk only time will tell. So thank you, Pauline, and thank you everybody for listening. And I think we're handing over to Belinda next. Yes, thanks, Lucinda and Pauline. Um, Belinda will take us through some recent case law and she will discuss two specific topics, one being how to remove business rescue practitioners and the second dealing with how to set aside a vote that was cast not to adopt a or to reject a business rescue plan. Thanks, Belinda. Thanks very much, Toby, um, and thank you to our audience for joining us. Um, you've made these webinars successful and it's on it's you joining us that that helps us and keeps us going in terms of preparing for these. Um, the reason that we chose these topics today was for me, number one was to give a bit of a break from COVID-19 jargon, but also because of COVID-19, there's obviously going to be a lot more business rescues inevitably. And the topics that the, the, the line that flows through the topics that I'm going that we're going to discuss today is we must make sure that the business rescue plans are detailed and that the idea of business rescue is to try and rescue the solvent the company back to solvency. That must be the underlying objective from the beginning. And the courts are emphasizing that more and more. In all four of these cases, although they cover different sections of the Act, the court continually emphasizes that the business rescue provisions must continuously be read with Section 7K of the Companies Act. And Section 7K emphasizes that the purpose of business rescue is to see if there's an efficient way to help the companies trade back out of distress. And you have to balance the rights and interests of all stakeholders so not particular stakeholders like in liquidation stake the stakeholders they are generally the creditors it's all stakeholders must be taken into consideration so as toby said we're going to cover two sections of the act the first section i'm going to cover is section 139 2e and that's particularly concerns affected parties applying for the removal of business rescue practitioners based on either a conflict of interest or a lack of independence. Now, there is not a lot of case law on this in South Africa. The first time it was touched on was last year, in the beginning of this year. The, um, the, the courts have emphasized that there's no um, precedence in South Africa, and so they're also navigating their way around these two, around this particular subject, sorry. So, the first case we're going to look at is Oak, um, Oak Bay Investments versus Tegeta, and the second case is Gupta versus Knopf and Klopper and others. The reason that these cases are so interesting is that they involve the Gupta group of companies. Both of them involve the Gupta group of companies. They involve the same interests and they involve the removal of the same two, the request for the removal of the same two directors. One judgment came out on the 30th of August of last year and another ju judgment came out in December of last year. Now, one of these judgments has gone to the SCA and you'll see at the end of this discussion why that's happened. So effectively, what it is, it's, a, it's the Gupta group of companies and in the Oak Bay, both uh, all the companies that we're, I'm going to speak about today went into business rescue based on resolutions passed, on voluntary resolutions passed by the board and not necessarily because the companies were in financial distress, but as one of the companies put it, that they were in commercial distress because the banks had removed their ability to bank to bank within South Africa, so they were unable to trade. So they call it unbanking in the case. So when I refer to unbanking, that's what I'm talking about, is the banks not allowing them to use their facilities anymore. Um, the, and both cases, the request was to remove the business rescue practitioners for either having a conflict of interest and or a lack of independence. Sorry, I was going to make, okay. Um, so in the first one, it was a director of one of the, I mean, the holding companies. And what had happened is in in previous court papers and business rescue plans, the business rescue practitioner had spoken about the, share, the shareholders being criminal and vilifying the shareholders. 
So what the accusation was that in making these statements, the the practitioners were state were basically showing that they had a lack of independence and therefore couldn't make independent judgments because they'd already vilified the shareholders. And the shareholders are part of a body of a group that they're supposed to be protecting and whose interests they're supposed to be taking into consideration during the business rescue proceedings. The court dealt with that pretty abruptly and quickly and it, it, the court basically said you don't need to like the shareholders of a business rescue practitioner you just need to make sure you don't act to their detriment so as long as the details in the plan don't show any sort of bias then you know there doesn't need to there doesn't need to be a very strong and a good relationship between the business rescue practitioners and the shareholders then the second acquisition was that the accusation was that there was a conflict of interest with the business rescue practitioners. And this arose primarily from the fact that over all the groups of companies involved, there were two business rescue practitioners that were involved in all of the companies as BRPs, either together or individually. And there were certain intercompany loans that had been dealt with in business rescue plans. Either there were discrepancies on how they dealt with that or they said that there was a dispute in terms of those intercompany loans. And by doing that, the accusation was that the practitioners were compromising the voting rights of the lender company. And based on that, there was a conflict of interest because the business rescue practitioners were basically um, preferring some creditors over others by not recognizing the intercompany loans. Now, when the, the court looked at this, as I said, it said there's no there's no law in South Africa. So they looked at the law of Australia, they looked at the court law of Canada, and they couldn't find anything analogous there. So then what they did is they started looking at liquidation and if there was an analogy in liquidation. And they made the decision there that you can look at liquidation analogies and try and apply that to the current circumstances in business rescue. So what is abundantly clear in liquidation is that there is a fiduciary duty to act in good faith and not for the benefit of any individuals um, or for the benefit of the business rescue practitioner. And what the court found in this specific circumstance and looking at the circumstances is they were saying, when the business rescue plans were published, they, the business rescue practitioners were not getting the cooperation of the management. In fact, they had to apply to court to even get access to the buildings. All the financials that they were working with in this particular case were unaudited financials. And that, that was the basis that they were working on when they published the plan. So they didn't have that much information at hand. What they did post publishing the first set of plans was they um, employed an independent, an independent forensic auditor. And after the auditor published his findings, they published new revised plans. And those plans took into account certain of the intercompany loans and they cleared up the discrepancies on the various business rescue plans. And the court said by doing that, they showed that there was no conflict of interest, that they were acting independent. And that the court couldn't find that there'd been any bias or conflict. And so the court found that they were independent and impartial. And the court further found that in liquidation scenarios, there are there is case law. In this particular instance, they referred to a case called Pelo versus the Master of the High Court, where it said that sometimes it's actually advantageous to have the same liquidator across the same group of companies because that liquidator will understand the companies and the relationships and the justification for intercompany loans. So that in itself can't create a conflict of interest. So they found that ultimately that there was no conflict of interest for the business rescue practitioners. One other thing that they did come down quite heavily in the facts of the matter are and especially relating to the intercompany loans is the fact that there'd been a subordination agreement and that subordination agreement had specifically said that if a company goes into liquidation or the equivalent and there's going to be a compromise on the dividend paid to other creditors, then the intercompanies actually wouldn't wouldn't lodge a claim in terms of the 
in this instance, the business rescue proceedings. So the court was saying, and in not disclosing that, they basically may try to make out a case for a conflict of interest when a conflict of interest couldn't have arisen in the first place because those loans shouldn't have been taken into account in any event. And it was for that reason, and this is what you should be cautious of if you bring in applications, the court actually ordered a punitive cost order on a 29 client basis against the applicant. Um, there, another issue that arose, and I'm just going to touch on this really quickly so that um, everybody is aware of it, is what is the business rescue practitioners raised the fact that this the Section 139 application for the removal of business rescue practitioners should have been coupled with an application in terms of 133. 133 says that when you bring legal proceedings against the in in the, in the against the business rescue. You need to either get the, the business rescue practitioners or the court's authority to do that. Now, the court found it in this instance, it would be obscure to ask the business rescue practitioners if you could apply for their removal. On top of that, Section one, Section 139 specifically allows affected parties to bring an application like this. So you don't. So it's it's given the authority outside of Section 133. So if you're bringing an application in terms of Section 139.2, you don't need to bring a parallel application in terms of uh, Section 33.1 in order to get authority to apply to a court. Now. That was the August case. Then came the Gupta case, which judgment was delivered in December. It was heard and delivered by a full bench, three judges, because the judges, the court felt that the issues were complex and the companies involved had, you know, had there was a public interest on whether or not these companies were rescued because they were supplying ESCOM with coal. So there was a full bench decision that that came out, and again, it was based on there being a conflict of interest. It was based on lack of independence, and it also involved two independent directors. I apologise. The one thing I didn't mention about the previous case is the court says said there were other business business rescue practitioners appointed with the two that were being applied to be removed and that in itself was a safety net of independence because with the other practitioners involved with these two they could be sound buffers and they could be safety nets for anybody uh, anybody accusing them of lack of independence and that i think that's a very important aspect that i forgot to mention and i think it's good to mention now because it comes up again in this case so as I said before, it again a conflict of interest and a lack of independence. What the court did here that it didn't do in the previous case was it actually applied a, a standard to the business rescue practitioners that they were also officers of the court. And because they're officers of the court, there's a much higher duty of, of care and to act in good faith. And this in this aspect, they were applying the African Bank um, versus Kariba case that came out of the SCA. They weren't a, so. What the court, so the facts were very similar to the previous case, but in this instance, there'd been a lot of selling of assets by the business rescue practitioners, and they had been earning commissions allegedly off off those um, sales, and they it had also the business rescue had been going for a long period of time. So in this instance, the court actually was quite harsh on the business rescue practitioners, and they said. You, as, as officers of the court, you need to balance the interests of everybody else above your interest to earn fees. And they found that while they were selling off assets, there seemed to be no plan to actually trade the companies out of um, insolvency or, or out of distress. There was no plan to get bank accounts, in other words, unbank it. Um, and the business rescue had continued for a very long period of time, and it said that that in itself went against what the Act had intended for business rescue. It needed to be a quick process and it needs to envisage that the, the business can be traded back to solvency in the most efficient manner possible. It also found that, and this is where I think the court showed its independence, not that I agree with their decision, but they said there were a lot of accusations in the court papers themselves about unlawfulness around the, the shareholders and the directors, but they said just the mere accusation of saying that things are unlawful 
doesn't make them unlawful. The business rescue practitioners hadn't filed any criminal proceedings. They hadn't brought this to the attention of the court before this application. And they said this in itself showed a lack of impartiality because if it was so bad as to warrant those sort of accusations to be made, the business rescue practitioners should have actually brought it to the attention of the court and should have done something about it. So they found the accusations of criminality in the proceedings was disingenuous because they had done nothing outside of the proceedings to pursue those that unlawful conduct. And they said it was also that the practitioners were contradictory because they kept on saying that they could trade the companies back into a state of insolvency, yet they're talking about criminality and in trading it back to solvency, they're going to give it back to those very people that they're accusing them of being criminals of. And the court also found issue, and this is where it differed a lot from the previous judgment. The also, court also found issue with the uniformity of business rescue, the identity of the business rescue practitioners across the group. And they said that this has got the conflict. It, it's got the potential of creating conflict of interest and, you know, compromising independence and impartiality. And the court wasn't particularly happy with this set of circumstances and they ultimately found that the business rescue practitioners hadn't conducted themselves with a standard that was professionally required of them as officers of the court and that they found that they could be removed. Now this particular case is now the subject of appeal. It's in line to be heard by the Supreme Court of Appeal. It's going to be a very important judgment that comes out because as I said before there's no precedent for this in South African law Australian or Canadian law, which is what, what the courts looked at. I think an important take from this is to make sure that when you when you do suspect as a BRP or a liquidator that there is some sort of criminal conduct, you need to do something proactive about it. Um, you need to report the criminality, you need to do something proactive to make sure that you're not just making allegations that are seemingly unsubstantiated in court papers in order to protect your interest. If you are a business rescue practitioner appointed over a group of companies, then try and ensure that you've got another business business rescue practitioner that is, is conducting the rescue with you that is independent and can verify your decisions over the various groups of companies. Um, and that, in a nutshell, is what the two courts cases had decided. They're both out of the same court, so it's going to be very interesting. One of the one of the grounds of appeal brought against this decision was the fact that they didn't consider the Oak Bay decision and the and the finding of the judge in that particular decision. Okay, then we're going to move on to section 153, which is setting aside the the vote the majority vote against a business rescue plan and there's two cases i'm going to touch on here the one is naidu and meshu which came out of the kwazulu court the, the kzn high court um in january of this year and then a, a decision that came out of the western cape in august of last year so the act basically allows for affected parties to reply to the court to have a majority vote rejecting the plan set aside for its lack of appropriateness. So it's an inappropriate decision according to the applicant. Again, the court is at odds to emphasize that the purpose of business rescue is to try and try and um, trade the company back into an undistressed position in a, considering this, you know, the, um, the interests of all stakeholders. So in the Naidu case, a, a, a transport company had gone into business rescue. The business rescue practitioner had created, had drawn up a plan in consultation with the sole shareholder and director of the company. The plan had been to trade the company back into solvency again. The plan was presented to the creditors and the creditors rejected the plan with a 63% majority. After that rejection, there were various applications and ultimately the um, various applications to repossess vehicles that had been subject to installment sale agreements. Though some of those applications were successful at the time of the hearing of this matter, some of those applications were, were still pending. But ultimately, most of the, the 
transport vehicles of the applicant that the applicant was using or that the company in rescue was using were repossessed by the creditors after the voting against the plan. So the applicant brought a section 153 to set the vote aside for being inappropriate. It, it accused the creditors of having an ulterior purpose and just looking after their own interests. And because proxies had been signed the night before the business rescue meeting, um, the accusation again was that they'd acted in bad faith and they hadn't properly considered the plan and they hadn't come to have the table pl the plan table at the meeting and they hadn't applied their minds properly. They hadn't considered that the costs of liquidation are much higher than business rescue, that the dividend will be lower in liquidation than it will in rescue. And so the court considered the court considered the overall um, facts of the case. And it says when you are deciding whether or not a plan is inappropriate, you've got to ask yourself two questions. One, is it an appropriate vote? And second, is it reasonable and just to set aside the vote? When you're looking at an inappropriate vote, you have to look again at Section 7 of the Companies Act and whether or not the vote is inappropriate in terms of the purpose of the act. If it is inappropriate in terms of the purpose of the act, it's automatically an inappropriate vote. Um, the courts again said it's an objective test. You have to look at all the facts from an objective point of view. And then in terms of whether it's just or reasonable to set aside, you've also got to look at other factors under section 150, uh, 153 and section subsection 7. And that's basically um, what are the interests of the persons that voted against the voting rights, what provision was made for them in the plan, and what is a fair and reasonable estimate of what those people would receive in liquidation. On the fact in practice, a in practice, a plan is published beforehand for the specific intention to consider the plan and make a proper analysis. And it's inconceivable that before coming to a meeting, a creditor wouldn't have already made an opinion about the plan. So the court found that there was nothing untoward as proxies being issued the night before in order to in order to vote against the plan. Then it looked at reasonableness and malafides on the part of the creditors that applied the Oak Dean case. And in Oak Dean, they had specifically said that you can only ignore a vote if it's reasonable and not bona fide. And uh, the, the court in this case relied on that quite heavily. And what they said is you've got to balance the interests of the creditors, the companies and all affected parties. So again, applying Section 7 and applied to the facts. What the court basically said is, is after the business rescue plan had been published, the assets, so its trading, its trading assets had been repossessed. So there was nothing to enable it to actually trade back into solvency and out of distress. And because the plan didn't have a lot of detail in it that the court found there should have been, so a, distinguished between, a distinguishing between secured and unsecured creditors, there were certain creditors that hadn't, their, their interests hadn't been considered in the plan. And they said, if those creditors had voted in favor of the plan, they would have lost their right to claim against the company after the publication of the plan because of section 154, which disallows them from doing that. And they they also looked at the fact that the, the business rescue was going to take another 14 months. In those 14 months, rentals weren't going to be paid. And what, then it balanced the interests of all the parties involved. And it said, ultimately, the plan was in favor of just the company and not the other and not the other stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And because of that, the court found that the creditors had acted in the only economically commercially sensible way that they could have done and therefore it wasn't on a value judgment taking into consideration all of these facts they found that the vote wasn't unreasonable and or unjust the act the case also it deals with whether or not um the brps are functus officio in certain respects whether there's reasonable prospects of rescue i'm not going to go into that detail now because we'll run out of time but if you want to look into that you can look at these ca this this particular case. The last case I'm going to look at is um, Verisol G Verisol versus Transnet, 
And this is a company that had its only asset was a head lease in um, Soldana Bay, and the head lease was over commercial property, and it had certain subleases under under it, and um, it had no employees, only two directors, and the plan that had been presented to Transnet included leasing a a, a space to a new um, lessor that would create a steel mill and would and from the lease proceeds therefore the company would be able to trade out of rescue the problem with this particular relationship is it relied on option agreements and it relied on transnet having to to buy into it and also approve the sublease agreement transnet voted against the plan and applied for the company to go into rescue there was a a counter application in terms of section 153 to set aside Transnet's um, vote vote against the plan. So the court applied in this case, the court applied a case called um, First National Bank versus KJ Foods. And in, in that case, they said um, the plan has to be, in, I mean, the vote must be inappropriate and it must be reasonable, just and equitable to reverse that decision to that is ultimately the decision of a majority creditor. The court again emphasized that the primary focus when going into business rescue must be the likelihood of trying to trade out of the existing financial distress. And only when it becomes obvious that that's not possible do you go to the second line and whether or not you can get a better return for creditors. And again, they apply when they looked at whether it's reasonable and justify and justifiable to set aside the plan. They looked at section seven, and they looked at the factors in section one fifty three seven again. Again, they said it's a value judgment, and they said if you look at the facts of this particular case, the plan didn't address certain things. It didn't cover certain details sufficiently enough. It didn't say why the the court, you know, didn't give enough detail as to why the court should set aside a plan that didn't have enough detail within it. And I think what what went more to the court's decision was the fact that the business rescue plan had a lot of speculation and a lot of contingency um, it, requirements within it. There were option agreements and it said there was just no uncertainty that in a certain period of time, Transnet would be in a better position than it would be if it was it just went into liquidation now and took possession of its asset and then managed to sublease the property, at, you know, lease the property itself instead of being bound into a sublease agreement. One of the options being that it bounds itself for another 15 years in terms of the sublease agreement. So the court looked at the commercial aspects around it and it said also if there's no if there's no proper contingency made in terms of the plan, there wasn't enough detail, it would take almost 20 years for Transnet to recover the real rent, rare rental already obtained, you know, already incurred, let alone going forward. So the court seemed to again apply commercial sense to whether or not Transnet um, made a, you know, made its decision on a commercially sensible manner. It weighed up issues like employees that said there's no employees, um, there's only two directors, there was no guarantee that Transnet couldn't still enter into the same agreement that the company had with, with you know, with other leases that, that were bringing in money. And ultimately, the court found that on the facts, there wasn't sufficient detail within the plan to justify what they were saying. So again, I think the take from this is you've got to make sure that there's sufficient detail in your in your business rescue plan to justify the position you're taking on that plan. You can't just rely on the fact that the court is going to look at speculative facts. They don't require an intense amount of detail, but they do require sufficient detail to justify why 